Adam Curtis from Tomorrow Man. Good morning, sir. How are you? Yeah, I'm well, Pete. How are you? Thanks. I'm very well, mate. Thank you very much for, for being involved in, in Recruitment Journeys, the podcast series. No, it's a pleasure to be here. Nice to be doing something different in the monotony of COVID at the moment. Well, yeah, I mean, we've, we've, had, a, we've had a quick kind of pre, pre-podcast chat and we've done the obligatory whinge about <laughs> homeschooling and, and getting through the day and the Groundhog Day factors. Um, but the end is in sight, we hope. We're in the final stretch, fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Is, the, is, the, is the Curtis family getting through in general, in, in, in reasonable state? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, I mean, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty lucky. You know, we've got a, we, we, we live in a great spot. We've, we've got a, the ability to isolate in our house and be pretty separate from each other. And despite the up and down of being stuck inside all the time, we're doing, we're doing pretty well. Thank you for asking. Good stuff, mate. Good stuff. Well, once again, thank you for, for, do, for doing this, for doing um, the podcast journeys uh, interview. Um, I will very quickly explain to anybody who hasn't heard before what the Recruitment Journeys podcast is all about. Um, as it says on the tin, um, it's about your recruitment journey, Adam. Uh, but we'll spiral uh, into, your, into your life journey because you're, you're a little bit of an interesting um, case study, Adam, because you're... I think the vast majority of people I've already interviewed, and there's, there's 20 plus, they are still recruiters. Um, you are no longer a recruiter. Uh, you were a very successful recruiter, but you, you took a different path. Um, and that forms part of your journey, and that's what we're going to explore today. In fact, the, the, the title of this podcast is The Recruiter Who Followed His Vocation. So that look, which sounds very grand, doesn't it? Very, very fancy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we'll go with it. We'll go with it. That's fine. Yeah. And that will all become clear as to what that means further into the discussion. Um, so look, I've already um, given you a bit of an introduction to the, uh, to the listeners and the viewers, but in your own words, Adam, can you let us know who you are? Sure. Uh, yeah, so my name is Adam Curtis. Um, I'm, I'm a now ex-recruiter and uh, an ex-director and owner of the Six Degrees Executive Business. And I'm currently the general manager of an organisation called Tomorrow Man. Perfect. Thank you. And we'll talk more about what Tomorrow Man is and, um, and how you found yourself to be there. But let's go back in time, Adam. It's the question I ask everybody. Um, and to be honest with you, I might have to come up with a, a better opening question because the answer seems to be the same from everybody. So yours might be different. Who knows? We'll find out. Yep. How and why did you break into the wonderful world of recruitment? Yeah, maybe I will have a different answer to this because Good. I... I, I didn't fall into it, if that's what most people have told you. Okay, um, I went for a job, like a, I went for a job in 1999, a long time ago. I was working at Optus at the time. Yeah. Um, and I went for an interview. I can't even remember the name of the organization, but I went for an interview with the recruitment business um, for a different job. I got the job that I went for, um, but I left it after five months. And unlike many, <clears throat> pursued a career in recruitment because... While I was in that job, I couldn't stop thinking about the interview process that I'd been through mm. um, and how, and just how cool it would be to help people find jobs and kind of help them shape their lives, mm. naively or not. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, I left that job after five months and I went on the, you know, went on the path of interviewing with a number of different recruitment agencies, uh, actively seeking out recruitment as a career and finally got a gig at, a, at an organisation that was then called Lloyd Morgan. Yeah. Very, very long time ago. So how long were you at Lloyd Morgan? I uh, might have been just shy of three years. Yeah. Yeah, maybe okay. just shy of three years. So still not a bad, not a bad stint for your first role in recruitment. Um, yeah. But then, um, you know, good, good fortune led you in the direction of, of Six Degrees, um, where you were for a very substantial period of time. How, how long was it, to be exact? Uh, it was just over three. 13 years, I think, 13, yeah. 13 years. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, 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 would, I, would, I would have thought that anybody listening to this, this interview in Australia would know who Six Degrees are, um, a phenomenal organisation, and you were there for well over a decade. When you, when you look back and reflect um, on your time with Six Degrees, yeah, what comes into your head? Uh, <clears throat> I mean... 
just off the top of my head, just a lot of love and admiration. Um, you know, they were they were just they were just very formative years the whole time, both mm. <clears throat> both as a a professional recruiter who arrived. I arrived in the door thinking I knew all there was to know about recruitment, um, and very quickly unlearned a lot of habits that I'd learned and uh, recognised that I still had a lot to learn. But also, but also just formative years as a man and as a human being. Mm. Um, you know, I, I I just remember them very fondly as a family. Like we, it always that word always comes to mind when I think about my time there. We'd spend a lot of time as an organisation, really trying to build that. You know, from a cultural perspective, but uh, but I always felt, in particular, from the founders, very much so that you know that I was not only part of the six degrees professional family, but a part of their family. Mm. Um, you know, they have really successful years. Um, you know, it was great to be a part of that business from from the outset and really in building, you know, building from the ground up what you've described to be a very, you know, very successful um, powerhouse recruiter. And that was that was an amazing thing. Mm. Um, it was fun. It was rewarding. It was it was deeply challenging at times. Um, it was life altering. Uh, you know, I think a lot of recruiters would also would also agree that in recruitment you can he experience some of the highest of highs and the lowest of lows and that was all true for me at six degrees but I, look ultimately Pete I think when I think about six degrees <clears throat> despite the professional it was actually just the backdrop for me transitioning from in life from you know a young reckless careless kid in his early 20s mm. um, through to you know through to being hopefully a successful um, and good man, husband, and father today. Mm. Mm. Okay, mate. So, obviously, so, so, so 13 years at, at Six Degrees, clearly something, something was going right in your career. The, tra the trajectory was going up. You were, you, were, you were being promoted. I'm assuming um, the, 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 the income was strong and, and, and healthy. Um, Fair to say that most recruiters, when they find themselves in that in that position, <clears throat> um, you know, they 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 sit tight, and they, you know, they they ride it for as long as as they can, because uh, clearly you were well regarded in the business, uh, you were well positioned, stability in your CV, good money, status, respect, all the rest of it. Um, but you left six degrees, um, and 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 you left six degrees not to go to a new another recruitment business um, and, and not to start your own recruitment business, which is what you know, often happens. Can you kind of talk to us about, and you, and you, and you joined from Six Degrees, you went to Tomorrow Man. Um, can you sort of talk to us about what was going on in that time that made you, from the outside looking in, of course, that made you uh, take such a drastic and different direction in your, in your life and your career? Why did you leave Six Degrees and why did you go to Mora Man? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, I, we, don't have, we don't have a lot of time, but it's, um, you know, it's the, it's, it's the culmination of a number of, you know, different periods and events yeah. in my life. And, and, so, and, and I'm, I'm thinking you might, you might need to, at some point, explain kind of in a nutshell what, what Tomorrow Man does as well. Adam will probably yeah. make sense. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll we'll get to that obviously. So I'm gonna I'll yeah. try and condense it, and I'll give you some of the things that you know I guess were you know were were highly influential in, yeah. in the decision, albeit they weren't the only things. Um, I should say thank you very kindly. Um, you know, you've used words like top of my game and successful and all those things. I mean, I, I'm the first person to say that I don't I actually don't think I was the greatest recruiter, Pete. Um, okay. I had my I had my share of wins and I had my share of losses, um, a share of ups and downs. I certainly rode my luck. Um, you know, I do like to think that I did the basics really well. Um, and I'm also, you know, I'm also mindful that I was very privileged to be able to climb, you know, the leadership ranks and become an equity stakeholder and all those bits. But, you know, all of that stuff is equal part luck than it was skill. Okay. Um, but, but through that time, yeah, there are a couple of major events. Like in 2013, I remember, um, I, was in a, I was in a new leadership role, a new associate director role, um, a new discipline. Uh, 
and the mentor that I was going to be working under um, within the first month of me moving into that role got very sick uh, very suddenly um, and was off work just um, unexpectedly without any, without any time due for him to come back. I was leading leaders. Uh, I was responsible for a P&L, for delivering a budget. I was in a market that I was learning and I knew very little about. Um, the team and the division was underperforming. I was underperforming um, in, in this division that had a very successful um, period of time prior to me. And on top of this, at home, my, my two-year-old son had just been diagnosed on the autism spectrum. My second child, my daughter Lola was due. My wife was at home, she wasn't working. Um, you know, we just bought a house, this house where I am now, the mortgage, you know, was, was large. And I just felt the responsibility of all of that. Um, you know, felt the responsibility of work and my profession and felt the responsibility um, as a man to be able to support my family. And, and mm. I just broke. Um, yeah, I just broke. I, um, yeah, I remember sitting at the table one night with my wife and she just, we were eating dinner across from one another and she just looked at me and she said, are you okay? And I just, and I just broke. I just, I just cried uncontrollably. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not okay. Yeah. Um, and the next day I went into the office and, and had a conversation with, um, with Paul Hallam, who I know, you know, uh, and yeah, that was kind of the beginning of a pretty severe battle with anxiety and, um, a prolonged period of panic. It was, it was kind of the second, my second life experience with mental health, but probably the first time that I'd actually recognized it or someone else had actually recognized it and called it out. Mm. Uh, and that continued, that was, you know, that was probably a period of six months that I really battled. Um, probably the second thing, the second event, it was the year, the following year. Uh, and I, you know, I never forget this weekend. I took a, I took a phone call from Paul on the weekend just to let me know that a member of our team, um, a guy by the name of Luke Riley, had taken his own life that weekend. Um, yeah, I mean, and that was that was one of the toughest phone calls that I've ever taken. Probably the toughest I've ever taken. I can't imagine what it was like for the people making those calls. Definitely the toughest Monday I've ever had coming to work. Um, you know, not really knowing what to expect, walking through the doors with a bunch of people that were so tight um, that had, you know, that had very sadly lost lost someone that they loved so much. We loved him. And um, yeah, it was really, it was really challenging. And you know, Luke had battled with his own mental health related issues, um, many of them and most of them very private, some public um, for a number of years. Uh, and, you know, we've done our best to support him through that. But, but unfortunately, you know, he lost the battle. Um, he, mm. he, was, he was a, you know, he was a beautiful man. Um, he was a father to, to a young son, not, not much older than mine at the time. Uh, and on the surface, he seemed like a, you know, a really successful guy. I mean, you know, I kind of knew some of the underbelly, but still, it was someone that I aspired to. He was an exceptionally talented recruiter. Um, and on his day, you know, he could just, he could light up a room. People were drawn to him. He had this big booming laugh. Yeah, but mate, mate, obviously, I, I, I never met Luke. I certainly didn't know him as well as you, but whenever I spoke to him on the phone, he was always really, really jovial. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, 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 was, he was a great bloke. He really was. And, and it was, you know, it was just, it was, it was just, it was, it was both shocking and sad. And like the days and the months after, after Luke, um, passing, like they really, they really hit me for six. Um, you know, that was my first experience of suicide with someone that I really cared about. Mm. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd seen it around me before, but someone that I really cared about. And as a new father, again, I wasn't, we weren't far apart in our kind of fatherhood journey. Like my emotions just at the time wouldn't allow me to process or understand why he took his life. Um, you know, with hindsight, you know, I, I clearly do mental health. It's, you know, it's tough. You battle, you do things you just can't control, right? But, um, you know, at the time, it sort of tipped me back into a really tough space. Mm. Um, and, then, and then I guess you fast forward uh, to early 2018. And like you said, like I'd been in recruitment for a long time. Um, I felt like I'd done all I could. Um, 
my my son was was in prep it was his first year of school and he was really struggling just with the kind of traditional classroom structure uh and so at the time i just decided to take six months off i said you know i said to the team i'm i'm, I'm going to move on i've given them plenty of notice uh, and i'm just going to go and reconnect with myself you know get into school and help my son reconnect with my wife and just you know um put my mind to the things that were really important having had a number of experiences that you know that made made that the case and um yeah like through through that time I crossed paths with a guy called Tom Harkin um, and Tom was a part of a documentary called Man Up in 2016 on the ABC. It's well worth a watch if, if your mm. listeners can have a look at it on ABC iView. But um, I learned about the work that he was doing with, with young men and, and, and older men around the country trying to help um, reduce the suicide rate. And, and because of a couple of things that I've just shared and, and also just my own upbringing and my story, um, you know, I grew up without, without a lot in a poor sort of outer suburbs, Western suburbs family, um, pretty dysfunctional and broken. And so with all of those experiences put together, um, when, when, when life put me in the path of Tom and Tomorrow Man, it was just, I just, like it was the it's life talking to me, right time, right place. I had no choice. I had to, I had to. I had to stop and pour my energy into trying to help the men of this country. Wow. Wow. Massive call. But so it was a no brainer. It was just, it just, it was, it was, it was, it was a quick decision. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, there's probably two parts to it, right? Like the decision, like the decision to, to, to work with Tom and to, to join tomorrow, man, absolutely no brainer. Like it just, you know, when they say, you know, when you know, and you just, you just have a feeling in your bones that this is what you, should be doing and you put here to do like that's that's it for me um the decision to the decision to move on from recruitment you know that that wasn't that wasn't a no-brainer that wasn't a quick decision that was that was something that was coming over a period of time like yeah. really asking myself deep questions about well what's important in life and what do i want to be doing and what's what's the legacy that i want to leave on this world um and so, yeah, it was a it was a longer a longer process to make the call to leave, but in to, in joining tomorrow, man, yeah, it was it was it was just yeah, mm. had to be. Mm. And look, yeah, I mean, re re recruitment oh, it's probably the same in any industry, right? Uh, but <clears throat> recruitment is certainly guilty of trapping people, right? So yeah. we uh, we 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 get trapped. We get, tra <laughs> and I hate to say it, say it out loud because uh, it makes me cringe, but we get we get trapped by the money. Uh, because it is, you know, if, if you do find a good niche and you 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 semi talented at what you do, you know, the money's good, and it, and that and that keeps you keeps you tra trapped is the right word. Brilliant, brilliant career. So uh, the, the 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 bravery, I suppose, that you demonstrated to to walk away from that is is what's fascinating. But at the same time, are you saying it wasn't bravery? It was just something. It was just something that you had to do. Uh, no, it, I think that yeah, I think it's it's equal parts like. It's funny, there's a question we ask in the work that we do in Tomorrow Man, and that is, you know, um, something in the order of if you can remember the last time you, you did something truly courageous. Uh, and for me, often the answer that springs to mind is the fact that I made a call to mm. up and leave what you, you know, what you pointed out was a, you know, was a successful career and a great salary and a all the things that come with having those things, a wonderful life that, you know, I, I didn't want for anything. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was to, to step away from that and kind of leave that behind. I, yeah. It's a really, I think it's a really brave thing, but equally um, it was, it was made all the more easier just knowing that, um, that, you know, trying to, you know, trying to help men and trying to um, just reduce the number of men that, feel the need to take their lives in this country you know, mm. trying to help with that cause is just, I just yeah something that i couldn't pass up mm. so we'll come back to we'll come back to your <clears throat> the next chapter of your life in a moment if you like and, and we'll go back to if you don't mind just go back to that uh, yeah that uh that, that sad situation that, that played uh part of uh a factor in your, your decision making that was when, when luke um lost the battle and took his own life how did that, what kind of, what kind of impact did that have on, on Six Degrees? Um, did, did it, would you go as far as to say it, it, it kind of changed them a little bit? 
as a yeah, business? Most def- yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really, it was really profound, Pete. Um, it was really deep. Um, it was heartbreaking. Um, it was, you know, it was um, in some ways culture defining. You know, there's just so mm. there are so many positives and and kind of negative experiences and emotions that the organisation, the business felt at that time. And it was it was in, it was challenging because there was we we're at this period where we're in our growth that the kind of core that had started and kind of been the real nucleus of the organization were for the most part all still there um and and we we knew luke a lot better than you know the newer people that had come into the organization and so there's a part of the business that felt luke's death perhaps a little more than than others Mm -hmm. but in their own right the others were you know we're having to deal with the fallout because there were so many people in the business that were just deeply affected. Um, But, but overall, yeah, I mean, we, we did as, we did as best we could in that situation. Um, You know, it's one of those things that I don't think you really know what you're going to do as an organization until it kind of happens and you just work Mm -hmm. your way through it not with any specific plan, but just with, you know, with openness and, you know, a kind heart and being human beings. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, look, all, all of the right supports were put in place for the people that needed it. Um, you know, there were people, you know, there were organisations that we brought in to help us deal with the aftermath of suicide. Um, you know, we, you know, we were very open and respectful to people that needed time or needed support or whatever they needed to be able Mm. to deal with that. And I think also, you know, importantly, um, you know, that we, we tried to do what we could do and support as best the family that he, that he left behind. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, Again, it was a deeply kind of profound experience for us all and one that's really shaped things. I mean, he was very revered by, but again, by that nucleus of the organisation that we'd grown up with him. And, and to this day, there, there are awards um, that are named in his honour. Um, and he's someone that is just fondly remembered regularly um, because, yeah, he's part of the legacy. He's part of what Six Degrees is. Mm, that's amazing. It's amazing. And it's, it's kind of leads on to the discussion of, of uh, I suppose, mental health awareness in the recruitment industry on the whole. It's, uh, it's something that is being discussed a lot at the moment for obvious reasons. We are in unique times and um, <clears throat> yeah, the, 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 the mental health of recruiters and indeed, yeah, the, the human race is... is is uh, is in discussion and the spotlight is on it. But I think I think recruiters, you know, we have for many years been expected to be to be bulletproof. That's kind of the the DNA that we're supposed to have. And um, yeah, the reality is, how many of us actually are bulletproof? Um, yeah, how many of us just put that that jacket on when we go to work and that's 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 the kind of game face. But you get home in the evening and. Um, yeah, it's not the reality, and mm. uh, yeah, yeah. S- sadly, you know, Luke is Luke is a is an example of that. How do you how do you do you do you have an opinion on how mental health in in recruitment is is viewed, or you've, you've probably been out of the game a, a few a few too many years, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've, I've thought I've thought about this. Um, obviously, in the work that I do now, I mean, what what I can talk to is how you know with my with my own mental health issues how six degrees took care of me Mm. um but i and i suspect that you know the answer around the industry or what organizations are doing from to to deal with mental health is probably different depending on the the organization you talk to right Mm. um again with six degrees and me uh and and you know this is it's specific, you know, very specifically to the founders in particular. Um, I mean, they, they were nothing short of amazing for me. Um, uh, they all dropped everything as soon as I, as soon as I spoke up. Um, and the response, you know, the, you know, the very loving and caring response was, was always about me, never about the division or the business. 
Um, it was always about me as a person. Um, mm. They gave me all the time unencumbered that I needed. Um, they, they were there every day on the phone or dropping around. They gave me the space I needed when I said, hey, I just need some space now. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, they are a big part of why I was able to get through that period um, as well and as soon or quickly as I did. Um, so, so that's six degrees as a whole. But again, I think you're going to get a different response. The thing that I would say though, Pete, is to your point, mental, I mean, mental health is not just an issue in recruitment, right? It's an, it's an issue everywhere. It's an issue in every business, in every part of society. And, and clearly at the moment, you know, COVID's a real litmus test for everyone's resilience and the bulletproof jacket that you talk about. Um, but with recruitment specifically, you know, it's a performance related industry. And so um, it's high pressure and there's a continual cycle. It's on a continual cycle that's short. You know, you're only as good as your last quarter or you're only as good as your last month. I'm, the amount of times I would have heard that over the years. And, and I think, you know, there's a level of um, performance anxiety mm. that's, that's, that's actually okay. All of us have it. Um, and, and, you know, a healthy level of performance anxi anxiety can actually help you perform better. You talk to some of the greatest athletes in the world, some of the greatest professionals in the world, they'll all tell you that they have a level of anxiety and actually drives them. Um, and so I'd be very careful in saying, you know, um, uh, we have to stamp out, um, you know, kind of the performance related nature of recruitment and, and anxiety as a whole. That's not, I, I don't believe that's the case, but mm. I do believe that um, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing in the industry overall if there was, you know, potentially more work done or it became more common practice for finding the specific link between well-being, mm. total well-being and performance as an outcome. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's some work that we do now, you know, that, you know, I've heard of some organisations that have well-being, um, well-being specific people or people in culture, um, you know, people in the organisation that have a real focus on well-being and performance. There are a, a plethora of external programs. We do some that really focus on, you know, just aiding individuals to really deeply understand themselves. Because mm. if, we, if everyone did work on digging deeper on who they are and why and how they came to be, um, they would, they'd perform better, they'd, they'd lead more authentically, they'd have greater resilience, they'd understand, you know, the kind of physical or physiological machinations of when things are out of kilter, out of balance. And so mm. if the industry could adopt a, a greater focus on something like that, I think it would only be beneficial. Mm. But like I said, there's there's a there's a component of um, there's a component of performance related industries where anxiety is part and parcel of mm. of the job. Mm. Mate, oh look, mate, we, we, we're definitely get as an industry, we're definitely getting better at it. Um, and yeah, it's it's a sad coincidence that yeah, you know, COVID's come along and, and brought it to the fore. But I um, I had a conversation with somebody not that long ago, and we were talking about the pressures and the anxieties that come with, with, with being a recruiter. And uh, I myself know if I, if, you know, pre-COVID, if, if, I, if I had a good, if I have a good month, that feeling of contentment, well, because it's, it's, it, because it's elation when you're doing the deals, and that becomes contentment when you, you think about, you're great, I've provided for my family for another month. Um, but then it gets forgotten about instantly because you, you then got to focus on the next month. And, yeah. um, I was, I was kind of having that conversation with somebody once and, uh, and he said, yeah, but that's the job you're in. Um, you, you have to accept that. And then he said, a soldier, a soldier doesn't go to, into battle not expecting to be shot at. Something like that. And it's a fair comment. It is fair comment. On, on one hand, it's fair comment. On one hand, we, we have to learn to deal with... The, the, the stress that comes with it. But, but the sad part is, you know, we, we, we do lose um, talented, exceptional, ethical recruiters who can do a bloody good job in our industry, for our industry, mm. um, who we don't need to lose. And I don't necessarily mean just by, by suicide, by, by people like leaving the industry uh, mm -hmm. because it just becomes too much. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, 
I have seen seen over the seen and heard. I'm sure you have as well. Obviously, in the job you do, but many you know many great people, great ethical recruiters that have been that have been spat out by you know by the the challenge that we yeah. talked about. I mean, I, I just think you know with with any industry, but recruitment in particular, you know, you, the strength of a recruitment organisation is its people. You know, it, they are its greatest asset. Um, and that's that's very very true in recruitment. And so without great people, nothing else matters. Mm. Um, and this, I mean, this was something we were always really aware of at Six Degrees, and we tried very hard to ensure that again we had the supports in place, that we, you know, built a culture that encouraged or or um, excited great people to come and join us. And so, again, my 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 I guess call to the industry is just look after people in a holistic way, mm. um, and and actually what what comes as a result of that is performance and, yeah. and great time. Yeah. Mate, do you miss recruitment? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, it's like, I'm not going to lie. I, don't, I mean, I don't miss the job, right? Yeah. The job itself, I don't, I don't miss. And I think I'm probably biased in that response because, because I love what I do so much now. Um, wh- what I do, what I do miss, um, I miss the people. You know, I miss, I miss not only the people of Six Degrees, again, you know, many of them are still great friends of mine. I have a lot of time for, for all of the people there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just built so many great relationships, friendships. Um, I learned so much from, from everyone that I ever worked with in, in the organization, but equally the people that I interviewed and the clients that I work for, you know, there was so much to take from all of that. Mm. Um, and so I miss that, you know, um, uh, but, but I think one of the things, you know, one of the things that I've been able to keep in this role in my new world that I had in the old, old world of recruitment, one of the things I loved about the job is that every day is different. Again, you would, I'm sure many recruiters that have been for interviews with organizations that have organ- clients telling them that every day is different, but it, it's true. Like new people, new context, new clients, new industries, new disciplines. It's just a constant learning um, and constant growth. And, and, you know, in many ways, there's, there's not, there are not too many industries better than recruitment for a person to really build and broaden their kind of commercial awareness and mm. knowledge. Um, and, and so that I miss, you know, that I'm lucky to have, I have a lot of it still in this job, but I really, I do miss that part. The mm. job itself, um, you know, I, I don't miss, I'm not yeah. going to lie. Yeah. Well, mate, kudos for, to you for, for finding uh, your passion in life. Um, so we, we, we've, we've touched on and talked around tomorrow, man, uh, here and there in this conversation with, uh, and the listeners might have got the gist of what it's about, but can you tell us in a kind of snapshot what, what tomorrow, man is, what it does, what your mission is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. It's, um, I mean, tomorrow, man, tomorrow, man's really just more of a question. Um, you know, and that question is, what does it, what does it mean to be a man or a bloke in 2020 and beyond? Um, we, we certainly don't claim to have all of the answers to that question, but we, we facilitate immersive experiential workshops, um, you know, that help, help men find those, the answers out to that question themselves. Um, last year we worked with 25,000 men, young men, older men all around the country, um, just exploring traditional masculine stereotypes, what's working for us, what's not. Uh, and providing men with the skills to really just self-author the version of masculinity that they want to live by. Mm. You think about it this way, like, as men, we, we, we go to the gym, right? We go to the gym and we work out on our physical selves to build up our physical muscle and our strength. But mm. where, do we go, um, where do we go to work on our emotional muscle? Like, where do men learn how to talk with gravity or with weight? about the, the stuff that's going on for them, often the stuff that's sitting right here under the surface. Mm. Um, and so Tomorrow Man, you know, provides those training grounds and spaces just to practice the skills in a safe space. And, and often what you find with, with our workshops is that once men see other men do it, once they see other men talk with gravity, they're like, wow, that's, that's really cool. And then they've seen someone else do it. So they give it a go and they're like, ah, that wasn't that hard. Mm. And you know what? Like, 
a man doing emotion and vulnerability is not an emasculating thing. It's actually mm. an incredibly masculine thing to do. Mm. And the kicker is that other men want to hear it from people. <laughs> and so, so that's what we do at Tomorrow Man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it'd be remiss of me not to talk about the other side of our business as well, which is Tomorrow Woman, which, mm. which, you, which you know about. I think, you know, we always think um, that women, as men, we always think, the society thinks that women are good at talking when compared to men. But, um, you know, women, women talk about their, their, their own deep stuff far less than you think. And for women, the issue is, is a little different as well in that um, it's, not just, it's not just speaking up. It's like they're often silenced by the, the contradictory expectations that are placed on them by the world, society, themselves, us as men. They're, they're always running you know, everything they're about to say through five, six, seven different filters before they actually say it. And they've got all these conditions. Um, of what they should be and what they should say versus just actually saying and being who they are. And so they speak up less. Um, and that happens from a very, very early age. And so the Tomorrow Woman, you know, the Tomorrow Woman program aims to, to do the same, and obviously help women reignite their voice and, you know, be brave, not perfect. Um, ultimately, both the organisations are about, you know, helping, helping, um, you know, helping men and women speak up. Cool. Mm, okay. <clears throat> I, 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 I knew less. I, I, I knew that Tomorrow Woman existed. I knew less about it until now. Um, I am curious. Are you personally involved as a, as a mediator, facilitator in the Tomorrow Woman program? Are you qualified? To no, do no, 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 <laughs> no, no. So, so my role, you know, my role, I sit across the top of the organization and run Tomorrow Woman. Yeah. Um, so, but our Tomorrow Woman program is delivered like Tomorrow Man by, women, by female facilitators. Yeah, yeah. And there's nobody better to talk to um, the issues that women face than women themselves. And I mm. certainly as a man wouldn't profess to understand um, as deeply the things that women go through, albeit, you know, my eyes are very open to yeah. um, the world that they live in. Mm. Uh, and that's, you know, I, that's got to change. Things have to change. Mm. Well, it's fascinating stuff. It's fascinating stuff, and but sadly, in closing, we have to bring it back to recruitment. Um, <clears throat> coming back to the concept of of the podcast, Adam, yeah, it is it is all about educate educating and inspiring others uh, by looking at somebody else's journey, and, and you are some somebody who yeah has successfully found another chapter beyond recruitment. Now, I'm not here advocating that everybody abandons the industry <laughs> that's, that's not what we're here to do but at the same time we all know that recruitment is not for everybody and and going back to my earlier point a lot of people allow themselves to get stuck in things um when they shouldn't you know and, it, and it's unhealthy for them to, to to stay in something that simply isn't right for them as somebody who has successfully found their next chapter maybe your, your final career chapter your calling if you like what advice would you give to somebody who, who knows deep down that recruitment is not for them, um, but, but maybe weren't as fortunate as you? Because it was kind of, it was almost fate, right? That tomorrow man kind of landed in your lap to some degree. You're, you're a pretty lucky man in that regard. You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe somebody out there is, is seeking it, but can't find it. You might not have the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway, because you're better qualified than me. But what advice would you give to, to that person Sitting in recruitment, thinking, "What's next?" Yeah, I mean, well, uh, yeah. I'd also want to say, yeah. I mean, I, in in preparing for this, I definitely don't want to advocate for every recruiter out there to go and throw the throw in the towel and leave because, yeah, you know, yeah. for some people, that that thing might well be recruitment, or it might be, well be something that recruitment gives them that is the thing that gives them fulfilment, and so that that's a wonderful thing if that's the case. Mm. Um, you know, to the person out there that's that's thinking you know, there's something else or I really, this is the thing that I love. I mean, I just, I would just say, listen to the voice, listen to the voice inside you, um, follow your heart. Um, your, your intuition is your life's compass and, and it's right more than it's wrong. And recruiters more than most, I think, know that. Um, and so, yeah, just embrace the discomfort that change creates because it's the only way you're going to grow as a human being. And um, mm. yeah, that's probably the best piece of advice I could give. Fantastic. 
Adam, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your candor, your honesty, your, you know, your, 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 your yeah, opening your heart. I, re I really appreciate it, mate. You're very welcome. And I, I should just, I should just add, um, yeah, I do, we've obviously talked about some, some heavy topics for people yep. uh, today. So, you know, if there is, if there is anything um, in today's conversation that has brought anything up for the listeners, um, you know, there are a number of services out there that they can reach out to. Lifeline, uh, Men's Line Australia, Headspace, Beyond Blue, um, Suicide Callback Service. Uh, and I also, you know, there's, there's a group that I've come across recently that, you know, are perhaps more immediate intervention. Um, that they're a group called Mental Health. Um, so you can check them out on mentalhealth.com.au. Uh, I think you might need a password, mental123. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. Um, but they're, yeah, they're a clinical and kind of perform clinical services performance coaching um, for men specifically that are done virtually. And um, we know at the moment, obviously, we can't travel around, but equally, you know, we're just recruiters in particular find it tough. Time is an enemy, right? Mm. And so getting yourself out to get some extra support might be a challenge. And the guys at Mantle, um, again, who are targeting men specifically, um, could could be something that's really helpful for you. Mm. And he's spelling Mantle with an A, M A. Yeah, M M A N T L E. Mantlehealth.com.au. Cool. cool. Well, look, I will ensure that when I put this podcast out, that we've got the links to all of the above, um, including the password. If you can send me that. And yep. um, again, thank you, thank you so much, sir. And uh, best of luck with your continued good work with Tomorrow Man. Um, and as importantly, best of luck with the homeschooling that you no doubt have to go and return to right now. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Thanks for having me, mate. Really nice to really nice to chat to you. And um, yeah, we'll talk again. Thanks, Adam. Take care, mate. Cheers. All Thanks. the best.